Hello, everyone. Hello. Our next presenters are from Brigham Young University. We have, and I slaughtered his name on Saturday because I'm trying to be better. Okay. He is Hiram Arneson. Better. Yeah? Better. All right. Okay. And Alex Ward. I do. Yeah. All right. Okay. And they're going to talk to you about a multimedia approach to performance. All right, so give them a nice welcome. Thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to be here at the National Conference. This is a presentation we gave at the Pedagogy, Pedagogy Symposium in January in Virginia. And we're really excited to be here again to give it at the National Conference. And we did tweak it a little bit this morning, so hopefully it'll be even better today. So our performance is called a multi, uh, not a multimedia, a performance, the mul the performance of multimedia <laughs> approach. Hopefully I can do better with the other things. But. Okay, so we want to start off with two short video clips. I'm sorry if these are a little bit loud, but they should be okay. So if it's too loud, it's like you might still hear it. Here's the first one. <laughs> Okay, that's the first one. Here's the second one. I'm past patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation and Let's try this one. I'm past patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation and reactions and act of creation. I'm laughing in the face of casualties and sorrow. For the first time I'm thinking past tomorrow. Okay, that's part of the second one. So which event would you rather be at? That recital where the young, the little boy was dragging his head along the ground, or would you rather be at this yeah, great new music? Yeah, you'd rather be at Hamilton, right? Hands down, not head down. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think a lot of times I've seen people feeling like that in classical music recitals, where it's a great performance, but they can still understand it enough to really enjoy it. And they might even think that they might be, wish they were somewhere else. Maybe one of you has felt that same way too, being had a great classical recital. Just great music, but going to somewhere else at the same time. Um, most modern media that people are exposed to is really calculated, deliberate to help them enjoy it, to catch their attention really quickly and to keep it. And classical music is a lot different. It, full, it unfolds in a matter of time. And it requires a listener to put forth a lot of patience and effort in order to understand it and to enjoy it. So whether we like it or not, our own performances compete with all this wonderful modern media. Melissa C. Dobson and Stephanie E. Pitts did this study to um, assess the response of first-time concert attendees at classical recitals. And the responses, well, first of all, their subjects they described as culturally aware non-attenders. So they were used to going to art shows and art exhibits, or maybe plays and shows, things like that, but they were unfamiliar with the classical music recital experience. And in the responses to the questionnaires, the, the subjects showed that they seemed a little bit, felt, felt a little bit lost and confused during the performances. And lots of them even indicated that they were not thinking of going to another performance anytime soon. I think that's really sad. I think lots of us, most of us want our performances not to just be for ourselves, but to be for those that are listening. We want our performances to impact and inspire other people, not just be something that they're like, look, they worked hard, yeah, yeah, that's good. Unfortunately, lots of people go to concerts and they go away only with this sense of wonder that someone could move their finger so fast or that they could memorize a whole 15 minute piece. So that really brings us to the question of how can we help our audiences to better connect with the music that we're sharing with them. Um, really, our suggestion for, for you today is that if we incorporate multimedia into our performances, then this will help bridge that gap. Uh, and when we say multimedia, really we mean incorporating any extra musical element to enhance the performance and to help the audience better understand it. This could include film, slideshows, or narration, or audience involvement, anything like that. Um, we are also really not saying in this presentation anything that towards the idea that classical music is dying. In fact, it was Charles Rosen who said, um, the death of classical music is perhaps its oldest continuing tradition. <laughs> We've always thought, oh, 
you know, no, it's not. We love it. We love recitals how they are. Um, but we have to stop and think if we do want to help more people to find classical music accessible, and if we want to help those who already go to many performances to experience it in more unique ways, this will be one of the best ways ever that we can, that we can help them to have that experience. So really we'll cover three ideas today. How this is an extension of our classical heritage, basically how composers would really cheer us on for this. Um, we'll share some examples and ideas, both from BYU campus, things that we've enjoyed, and other things that we've seen. Um, and we'll share how this will help encourage young performers to want to perform, um, especially when they're in our own studios as well. All right, so perhaps the best example of classical composers that meshed, meshed a whole bunch of art forms together is Richard Wagner. Thanks, Alex. So there's the beginning of the Tango de Zolda, his famous opera. And lots of his operas, and all his operas, he mashed together um, great music with stage action and wonderful poetry. And I say mashed together, but really um, of the ideas and the the people and the places and even the feelings in his operas find their way into his music as powerful light motifs. This little clip that Alex just played is a light motif that represents longing, intense longing. It's like whenever you hear bum 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 ba dum bum ba dum, you know that Darth Vader is going to come walking into the room. That's that's a light motif. And um, uh, from that little example, there's an next slide. From that little example, we can see that um, many film composers have found inspiration in the works of Wagner and other symphonic composers. So the stuff that we watch and we enjoy today in, in the movie theater is inspired by some, some of these classical composers. Uh, my favorite example of this too is Scriabin. Towards the end of his life, he started working on a huge work that he called Mysterium. Um, and this was going to be a week-long event that it would be performed in the Himalayan mountains. It would involve incense, dancing, lights, music, of course, um, many, many different art forms together. And he believed so strongly in the power of this experience that he believed that at its conclusion, all of humanity would transcend to a higher plane of existence. Um, it didn't happen, by the way, unfortunately. Uh, it, I like to think it would have worked. Um, but we, it just causes us to wonder, what would Skirabin have done if he had had access to the modern technology that we have now? What kind of experience would he have attempted to craft for us? And here are some other examples of composers that found inspiration in extra musical ideas for the music. So Schubert combined poetry with his, with his music in his leader. Um, but Ravel found inspiration in fountains and images of nature, which I found in his music. Eric Satie, sorry, Messian first, he found inspiration in birdsong and he even transcribed it and put it into his music. And then Eric Satie, the great Dadaist, he um, loved what one of my professors calls acidic wit or irony. So lots of humor in his works. Think about what you could do in a performance of one of these composers or Scriabin or Wagner. I don't know if you have to add anything else to Wagner, but Think of what you could add to one of these for one of these composers to enhance the work and help the people understand it. So now we'd actually like to give you um, an example of what this experience might be like.
There is a small clip from Les Gibets, Les de la Nuit, by Ravel. And isn't that powerful, listening to that and seeing the image of what the, what the piece is about? Um, for someone who doesn't understand that this piece is about some, the, someone hung, they would might think it's beautiful music. It's kind of long. And how long is that? How long does it's that? About six or seven minutes. Six or seven minutes. So it's not terribly long, but just the incessant B flat. Um, it's, it might be a little bit confusing. The first time I, I learned what this piece was about, I remember that performance. I was thinking about it the whole time, and it was it was riveting. And so this is a, what we just did here. It didn't take away from the music. It's not like we had all this extra stuff. We could all focus on what Alex was playing but at the same time you can come contemplate what the music might be about. And so let's show some other examples here. Here is a performance by one of our students. She played Janacek's In the Mist. It's, it has four movements, and she put an image with each different movement, and that helped the audience recognize, oh, there are different movements with different moods, and it helped them understand what her own conception of the piece was through the images. And this next one was one that I really liked that I attended, three of our good friends gave a performance of all minimalist music. Um, and that's honestly difficult to pull off in a concert experience. They're playing glassworks and arbo paired. Um, so what they decided to do was, all through the performance, they paired up these different sections of minimalist music with a full silent film. It was uh, A Tale of Two Cities, uh, inspired by Charles Dickens' novel. And for me, I walked away and thought about this performance for hours because, because I wasn't familiar with the story, which I should have been, um, and I was, wasn't very familiar with his music. And I think one by themselves, I might have zoned out, I might not have enjoyed it, but somehow them coming together really made me, really impacted me. And I really wanted to, from that point, explore more about how to do multimedia performances. Here's another example. Poulenc's Le Soirée de Nazelle. I don't know if I say that right, but hopefully close. Um, this is a bunch of variations that Polink wrote as, he improvised them as portraits of family members and friends. So they each have a distinct character. And this student found video clips to go along with each different character. And again, that helped the audience see or understand that there are different characters involved in a set of variations. So now stepping off the UI campus, um, I attended a performance that I really enjoyed. Um, up at Utah State University by a visiting professor, Dr. Alan Huckleberry from the University of Iowa. And he performed the complete Dresky variations on the people united will never be defeated. How do you say that in Spanish? El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. Thank you. Uh, but, and it's a wonderful piece. I was familiar with it before. Um, however, what he did that was so incredible during this performance is he had chosen 36 pictures before, beforehand and timed them to match up with each variation of the, in the piece. And these pictures were actually about current social and political issues. And what was so powerful about this was it gave me a visual cue to follow the structure of the work because I was able to keep up with exactly when different variations were coming in and follow it that, that way. But contemplating the meaning of these images and the challenges associated with them really helped me to understand better the feeling behind the original composition because that piece was all about political activism. Let's not forget about the important element that humor can play in a performance. When people laugh, it just makes the experience better. So let's watch this uh, video from my favorite comedian, Victor Borga. Hopefully you've heard his name before. And hopefully he will play. <laughs> Go look him up, he's great. Oh, should I dance like Yeah, I think I was too. Um, a couple friends of mine and I got together a couple years ago to form a piano quartet, and we wanted to help people enjoy music and also introduce them to great classical music. And in our, in our performances that we've given, we've incorporated things similar to this, like switching pianos or doing some really poorly executed Latin dancing. And for the encore of our first performance, we gave a whistling, a whistling uh, medley or presentation. We all sit in a row and we whistle the way a popular hymn tune. And after we whistled the hymn tune, we went into this 
pretty crazy cue. It was actually pretty hard to memorize. And then we had this very witty cadence. And after the performance, we had a lot of audience members that were there and others who had just heard about the performance ask us to keep giving more performances. So we continued to give performances. And what's great about this is that in addition to the sword fighting and the, the arrangements that we've done, we've been able to present our own solo repertoire. So we've helped the, we've introduced things like Chopin etudes, other pieces by Debussy. We put, I played the Carl Vine Sonata for an audience, a piece that they probably never had heard before. So that helps our audience to enjoy it and get introduced to a lot of great classical music. And so the, all of these things um, we focus on so far have been about our performances, really. But they all have application to how we can help in our studios um, for the recitals that we set up to be more enjoyable for people who attend, but also for the young performers themselves to be really excited to be able to perform. And so we're going to share a few ideas about this as well. So this is uh, Helen Boucher did her doctoral dis dissertation on performance stress for young children. And she found that the stress, the performance anxiety is a learned condition, that they don't have it in the first performance, but that they might learn it over time over a couple performances. So if we can catch children at the very first performances, helping them to enjoy music and performing through their own creativity, aka multimedia performances, then they may not incur that performance stress as much. A study done by Montello Coons and Contour found that two things helped Two, among other things, helped to relieve the performance anxiety among musicians and performers. You can transform anxiety through creativity, and bonding with others in a musical experience helps you not have that performance anxiety. So this goes back to what Hiram was saying about collaboration. Um, collaboration is a great way to help people feel not alone on stage. Um, as students play duets, or even larger collaborations, if you can organize it, um, they feel like they have friends up there, and that not all eyes are just on them for this time that they're performing. Um, also, audience involvement. Could you all stand up actually for just a second? Um, we're going to try something right here. So with your right hand, I want you to come down, up, down, up in a two pattern, essentially. And in your right hand, now we're going to do a three pattern. Go one, two, three. One, <laughs> two, oh. three. One, two, three. One, two. Three, we'll do this one more time. Two, three, one, two, three, and sit down, please. Thank you. <laughs> something as simple as that, the fact that you stood up, the fact that you had to think about something or respond in some way, interact, it is actually a therapeutic release for an audience member. And so if you think of how Hiram used the word stale, um, recitals can feel to people, giving them an opportunity like that to express themselves or to enjoy themselves just for a moment or somehow participate in what's going on is a really big therapeutic release for them and can help them want to hear more and return as well. Students can also prepare their own artwork uh, to be displayed in during their performance that shows what they thought of the music that they're playing. <laughs> you can also theme recitals and have decorations, costumes around different holidays or around maybe a specific composer, a time period, a period of music. You can experiment with special lighting. Um, whether it's as simple as dimming the lights like we did earlier, or having colors. Once again, things that take the eyes away from just this poor six-year-old child on a stage with everyone looking at them. Um, things that can help them to, to feel more comfortable on stage. And of course, humor. As kids are able to laugh before they go up to perform, they can feel stress go away. And also, as audiences are able to laugh, they can feel um, also greater enjoyment and connection to the music that they're sharing. We're about out of time, but I want to mention that the audience is the most important part of coming up with these multimedia performances. Um, here's a little test. I'm in school, so I do a lot of these. Um, so your, the idea is you have to put the A, B, C, D where they go along here, so they correspond with the, 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 this column over here. So obviously, we're not going to do a Christmas sing-along at a doctor recital. That will, probably would not be appropriate. I don't know if the professor would be super happy. But that would probably be appropriate in uh, the neighbor's audience. Or elementary children. Or elementary children. So here's a possible, some possible answers for this little test. Hopefully you got an A. Just always remember that the audience is the most important. So really, these are the things that help us to be able to connect better with um, people less familiar with music. And for musicians to experience music in new ways. 
Um, some of you actually have probably either attended a performance that was approached in this way or even participated in one as well. And that is great, that is wonderful. We, we love that. Um, but what we're suggesting is actually that all of us need to, really as a whole in the country, start doing this regularly. So this becomes actually a happy expectation for concert goers. Um, if you knew that you'd have this kind of experience or this kind of um, uh, impact when you attended a classical recital, you would be excited to go. Even if you've heard the piece before, you'd want to see how they're going to approach it. You'd want to see what thoughts that they have to share with that, with that piece. So we really know that as we incorporate multimedia into our performances, it will help our audience better understand the music that we present. It will help younger children be excited to perform. And it will help us deepen in our own artistry as performers. So thank you very much. My teacher assigned it to me before I went to college. I was graduating from high school and she told me to look it up and then you bring it. I was choosing between that and the box of Sony Tricks on a D minor, so I chose the Carl Bein first and I played this film later. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.